review the agenda in our pre-meeting. <clears throat> See if there are any questions from commissioners about any items on the agenda. Um, <clears throat> interpretation services are being provided for the county commission meeting this evening. Uh, the interpreters will be using microphones and headsets to ensure that all those attending tonight can fully participate. Um, all right, we'll start off the meeting with a pledge. Invocation, ethics reminder. Are there any items on the consent agenda that any commissioners have any questions about? Okay, great. Good news. We have um, the topic is mountain mobility, uh, receiving innovations in transit service award, and Matt Cable from Planning will present this item. We have a proclamation of National Service Recognition Day, and Commissioner. Uh, Beach Ferrara will present this, and Wisenhunt, the senior corps member who manages uh, the program, will be here to receive the, re the resolution. Our public hearing is a rezoning request by Keith White and Zen Tubing, and Nate Pennington will present this. Under county manager's report, we have the Isaac Coleman update. And I believe that uh, Commissioners Frost and Whitesides will help tee up this item, and then Lisa Eby and community engagement staff will um, also be involved in this presentation. All right, under new business, we just have the board appointments. Um, and so we'll go over that list when we get to that. And <clears throat> finally, um, we'll have public comment from any citizens who wish to address the board. Um, we also will have public comment on any items that we vote on during the meeting. So I believe at this time that that is simply the public hearing for the rezoning request that's um, on the agenda. I don't anticipate voting on any other items on the agenda. If, Mr. Chairman, there's the uh, library board. Uh, <coughs> So thank you. So 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 one one caveat to our policy: we don't typically take public comment on our appointments to boards and commissions. So we will be voting on those boards and commissions tonight, but we will not take public comment on those appointments of citizens to those boards. And this one involves also if you want to decide where to put it on the agenda. It changes the resolution. Thank you. I get you now. <laughs> All right. So yes. Yeah, so. Um, so let's discuss that for just, just a moment. Um, and I think technically, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Fru, um, we'll need to discuss this when the meeting actually starts since we will need to vote on that. But there was interest as we interviewed the um, applicants for the library board to expand the number of appointments from five to nine. So if we're gonna do that, we need to do that by consensus. So once we so so uh, once we start the meeting, I'll ask to add that to the agenda and we'll need to do it by consensus. Right. Any other questions about the agenda? All right. Uh, I believe we're ready to go. If Max could start the introductory video. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for the March 6, 2018 meeting of the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners. Let's begin the meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge.
Thank you. I'd like to ask all who were with us in the council commission chambers this evening to please um, silence your cell phones by turning them off and putting them on mute. Since our most recent county commission meeting, <clears throat> Buncombe County has lost one of its most beloved citizens, the Reverend Billy Graham. Following his death, upon instruction from Governor Roy Cooper, uh, flags on county facilities were flown at half mast to honor the life of Reverend Graham. I'd like to read um, a short statement that was placed on the county website last week. The Buncombe County Board of Commissioners, on behalf of our citizens, join the world in honoring and saying goodbye to Billy Graham. Born in Charlotte, Reverend Graham and his family were our citizens for many, many years and residents of Montreal. The man who met with the past 12 sitting United States presidents, participated in eight presidential inaugurations, and helped the nation through 9-11, became the fourth private citizen to lie in honor at the Capitol, following Rosa Parks and two Capitol police officers who died in the line of duty. Reverend Graham's family said that he, the son of a dairy farmer, probably would have blushed at the outpouring of support here at home in Washington and in Charlotte. But for those who have gathered over the last few days, his humility was a big part of why it became. From the time Reverend Graham's ministry began, in the late 1940s, his straightforward message never changed, something many in line outside the Capitol said they appreciated and admired. The citizens of Buncombe County are grateful for Reverend Graham and his family and their life boatwood. Also since our last county commission meeting, <clears throat> our community witnessed the release of one of the most disturbing incidents that's been captured on video in our community. On the night of August 24th, 2017, as he was walking home from a long day at work, Johnny Jermaine Rush, a citizen of Buncombe County, was beaten in the street by a Nashville police officer over purportedly jaywalking. This incident is disturbing because of the level of violence inflicted on Mr. Rush. It's also disturbing because of the corrosion of trust that it creates between law enforcement and citizens and between the community and local government as a whole. Before we begin our commission meeting this evening, <clears throat> I'd like to ask for a moment of silence during which people may offer prayer or reflection on the life of Reverend Billy Graham let us also reflect on how we may take steps to heal the wounds of division that exist in our community and find justice for all of our citizens. Please join me in a moment of silence. to read the um, ethics reminder for the board. In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by this board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, <coughs> to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, and to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to avoid and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Also, does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters that are voted on by the board tonight. All right, um, let us take up the um, question of amending the agenda to the board, so um, to the board meeting. There is an interest in increasing the number of uh, positions on the new library board from five to nine. And um, 
County Attorney Mike Frew has drafted an amendment to our previous resolution. So could you just kind of talk us through uh, that yes, process? Yes, sir. Uh, back in December, uh, this board adopted resolution 171204, creating, uh, recreating the board of trustees at the County Library Board. Uh, the provisions of this time, uh, the revisions at this time call for uh, just simply amending that resolution uh, to add this to the agenda on any item of wishes to increase the number of members of the board from five to nine, that three members of the would come from each district, Buckingham County Commission of District at the time of the appointment, that the board would be renamed simply the Library Board, and that the quorum would be five members. Very good. Is there, is there a consensus to add this to the agenda? Motion. Yes. All right, there's a motion and a second. All in favor of adding the amendment to the resolution establishing the library board to the agenda, say aye in just a moment. Just to clarify the process, we'll, 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 first we need to vote to add it to the agenda, and we need to vote to approve it. Yes. Okay, first to add it to the agenda, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. While we're at it, can we go ahead and do this? <laughs> and, and then I would like to say um, we are all blown away by the applicants, and um, this is what um, why we chose to change it um, because they were extraordinary applicants. Does the board wish to go ahead and do this now, or we could take it up when we pick up the board commission items at the end of the meeting? Any preference? I'll just make a motion to approve. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Um, uh, further discussion? Yeah, I'd like to comment also. Um, we had close to 30 people apply for the, for the library board, and so we originally established you know, five as a number. And uh, as Commissioner Frost has said, as we, as we got it, everyone had different qualifications, but they all were amazing. And so, you know, the board has the ability to do this since we wrote the resolution to increase the number. And uh, having three per district gives good representation. And the quality was there, and the input, I think, will be even more uh, you know, of an advantage having uh, multiple people on there. So. I think we'll all say that we were, we were pretty amazed by the people we talked to. I'm happy to support the additional. Great. Any other comments? So, since we are voting on this, and this is a policy decision to increase the size of the library board from five to nine and call it the library board, I'm going to ask if there's any members of the public who would like to comment on the proposal. And again, Mr. Free, if you would just, since this wasn't on the agenda, if you wouldn't mind, just summarize the highlights and the changes you can once again. Yeah. And I'll just ask the board if it's going to be on the new business or board appointments, but that's just, that's up to the board. But the only, the only change is the original resolution. Uh, change the name of the library board, increase the number of board members from five, that will be nine, that will be ten members from each commission or district at the time of appointment. And that would also change the quorum to five members in the majority. So there needs to be three members from each district at all times? If there's any, uh, it's written right now that there's any, uh, uh, any designs or phrases that you can't serve, then this board would make the remainder the remainder of the term. It's not spelled out now whether or not they would have uh, one year, two year, three year terms, but uh, the thought was that we left it to be the cell and then we So I do have I do have a question on that matter. Um, partly just from sort of a process standpoint of the kind of the I think having uh, people from districts is great to ensure geographic diversity. Having some at large people seems kind of nice too, but also as a practical matter, I believe that one of the folks we interviewed today currently lives in one district but is maybe moving to another. So if we're going to appoint these nine folks, then I'm a little concerned we might um, run afoul of that requirement. So <clears throat> I'm wondering if maybe we should um, provide a little bit of flexibility on that. Maybe 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 two from each district and and some some at large on the other three. And I didn't know the budget of the 
board, so we sort of funded and just said at the time of the appointment to give some flexibility. Yeah, they have in the We are there. Okay. Uh, they have each district count. And the way it's moved to could be a district one anyway. No, it's not. Oh, it's not. He's not in that district. It's part of it. It's both. It's both. But I think you're going to run into the situation in the future that they may move. Right. Um, but at the time of the appointment, he lives they have to be a they have to be in the district, and that's the way the resolution is written, right? Yes, sir. So currently, the nine that we have on the list. Uh, meet the requirements of the resolution. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are any other questions? All right. I'm gonna, if it's a, is it okay? We just go ahead and we'd like to just address this now on the agenda. All right. Are there any members of the public who'd like to comment on the motion? All right. Uh, Mr. Rice. Come up.
Let's move on to the consent agenda. Are there if there's uh, are there any questions about the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve and to follow the remainder of the agenda? Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. Okay, under good news, we have Matt Cable from Planning to talk to us about Mountain Mobility receiving an Innovations and Transit Service Award. Matt, thanks for this. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Um, we do have a presentation tonight that details uh, a few of the awards that Mountain Mobility has won. Um, I'm glad to be here representing the Planning Department of Mountain Mobility. Uh, I also want to recognize a few folks that are with us um, in the audience tonight that have come. Uh, Elena Carter, who's the General Manager of our Mountain Mobility Operations. Um, she has played a role in the awards that we've received this year. She's actually worked with and been a part of Mountain Mobility as an organization for over 16 years. Uh, Jesse Paget, who's our Safety Training Manager uh, with Mountain Mobility Operations. Um, he's been involved with Mountain Mobility uh, in some capacity for the last nine years. Uh, also involved in, in the recognitions we've received. Uh, and then Vicki Jennings, um, who's our Transportation Program Manager. Um, she works at the Land of Sky Regional Council in that capacity. Uh, has been with Mount Mobility in that capacity for the last three years um, and played an integral role in another one of the awards that Mount Mobility has received. Um, and we do have a presentation. So the first award um, that I'll mention uh, is an exciting award that we received um, back in September, at the end of September in last year. It's the Innovations in Transit Service Award. This award um, highlights an innovative transit service solution and an associated positive service outcome after that solution was implemented. This award goes to a single public transportation system each year uh, out of the hundreds across the state. Um, and it's recognized at the North Carolina Department of Transportation Public Transportation Division <coughs> Annual Conference. This was the first year of the award, uh, so we were the inaugural recipient, and we were competing against seven other entities that had submitted for that particular award. Mount Mobility was recognized for developing a program that was to improve on-time performance. That's one of the key uh, customer service goals that we have, is to have a good quality on-time performance for the organization. Uh, we delivered an innovation by providing a more effective public transportation service using the existing resources that we had, meaning there were no additional vehicles, vehicle operators, additional staff, or any kind of software. So we used the resources that we had in-house uh, to make that improvement. And then also improving the on-time performance without impeding other aspects of our efficiencies, like productivity um, in terms of trip provision. So why uh, did we apply for an innovation award, and, and why was there an innovation that was needed? Um, at Mount Mobility, and as a county, we track our performance uh, on an annual basis, monthly basis, weekly basis. And we noted <coughs> that in the fiscal year 13 through 15, we saw a decline in on-time performance. Um, this was alongside an increase in ridership and an increase in efficiencies in terms of trips per hour. And those were things that were factoring into why that performance was slipping from you know, what our target goal was. Uh, and so what we did was to be proactive and say we're recognizing that this uh, is being impacted, so we need to do something innovative to correct that situation. Along the same time in FY15, we had a requirement from the DOT uh, that each community transportation system, as Buncombe County is, as Mountain Mobility is, um, that we prepare a success plan. And basically that was a performance-driven plan for each system uh, in order to determine what areas we wanted to make improvements on and how we would go about doing that. One of the strategies was to develop a new employee recognition model that would, in, uh, that would emphasize employee delivery of services on time. So really focusing and honing in on on-time performance is a key measure of what we do and how to improve that. So you can see here, this is a chart that's a month by month recording of our on-time performance. You can see the kind of the load that happened, recognizing the solution needs to be implemented. Uh, that's highlighted there in September of 2015. And then immediately after the implementation of that solution, we saw results. And then the system. 
the other thing that we were concerned about, as I mentioned initially, is making sure that with those improvements, we didn't lose any of the efficiencies we've been gaining in terms of trips per hour and other things. Again, not adding more resources, but using what we have and making sure that we were doing that effectively. And so here you can see, not only did we improve the on-time performance, but our trips per hour, our productivity, actually increased at the same time. Since um, the implementation of that particular program, we've had some record high months in terms of on-time performance. We've exceeded our goal in certain months. We've had four of the highest on-time performance months since 2011. So this has been a very effective um, effective implementation for us here at the county and for Mountain Ability. Um, this is an acknowledgement from the PTD director that basically indicates that our particular um, initiative was very innovative in that we didn't use anything beyond what we already had. And it was an emphasis on employee ownership over the goals of the organization. And that was why we were selected as the recipient of that particular report. The second set of awards that I'll talk about um, are our NCPTA Rodeo Competition Awards. Um, now, a rodeo, it's a little different. Um, it's R-O-A-D-E-O. Uh, people always go, why do you have rodeos in transportation? Um, but here, a rodeo is actually, it's a skills course, basically. Uh, and it focuses on safety and skills uh, of vehicle operators. So every year we send a group of vehicle operators to compete against other systems across the state. Um, and these are obstacle courses. Uh, there's a photo here that shows they're driving between cones. Sometimes they're driving tracks between tennis balls, large vehicles that do quick stops. And there are a lot of skill sets that they use, and that's uh, for safety. Um, and in these competitions in 2017, we had the second place team, a third place individual. Um, it's a very competitive thing. The year before, we had been first place in team and first place individual. So we continue to place and show in those particular awards, um, indicating the emphasis we have on safety and skills of our drivers. Each driver does receive um, two weeks of training. Um, so that's a huge emphasis for us that our drivers, when they go out on the road, are equipped um, to drive our vehicles and to drive our customers safely. And then the final award that I'll mention um, is the Innovation Award from NATO. Uh, so this was a separate Innovation Award that we received um, last year as well, uh, towards the latter half of the, the year. Um, this National Association of Development Organizations Award was for the RIDE program, which is our Ridership Independence for the Disabled and Elderly. This is a taxi voucher program that we leverage grant and local funds for in order to give uh, elderly and disabled individuals access to taxi service at a discounted rate to give them more access to public transportation uh, opportunities. So we had a, a really good last year <laughs> and we're taking that on in this year um, challenging ourselves to continue to be innovative, continue to progress. Um, we're having our radio competition a little earlier this year so in April we'll be sending another team and we hope to bring back the boards there as well. So thank you very much. item on our agenda is a proclamation of National Service Recognition Day and Commissioner Jasmine Beach Farrar will present the proclamation and Ann Wisenhunt, the senior corps member who manages the senior companion program will receive the resolution. Thank you for being here. Thank you both for being here. I will read the proclamation and then if there's anything you'd like to share, please do. Uh, this is a proclamation of National Service Recognition Day. Whereas service to others is a hallmark of the American character and central to how we meet our challenges, and whereas the nation's counties are increasingly turning to national service and volunteerism as a cost-effective cost strategy to meet their needs, and whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps participants address the most pressing challenges facing our communities, from educating students for the jobs of the 21st century and supporting veterans and military families, to providing health services and helping communities recover from natural disasters, 
And whereas national service expands economic opportunity by creating more sustainable, resilient communities and providing education, career skills, and leadership abilities for those who serve, and whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps participants serve in more than 50,000 locations across the country, bolstering the civic, neighborhood, and faith-based organizations that are so vital to our economic and social well-being, and whereas national service participants increase the impact of the organizations they serve, both through their direct service and by managing millions of additional volunteers, and whereas national service represents a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solutions and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community <coughs> impact and increase the return on taxpayer dollars. And whereas national service participants demonstrate commitment, dedication, and patriotism by making an intensive commitment to service, a commitment that remains with them in their future endeavors. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of Commissioners for the County of Buncombe as follows that this board does hereby proclaim April 3rd, 2018 as National Service Recognition Day in Buncombe County, that this board does hereby encourage residents to recognize the positive impact of national service to our county and to thank those who serve and to find ways to give back to their communities, and that this proclamation shall be effective upon its adoption, adopted the sixth day of March, 2018 by the Board of Commissioners for Buncombe County. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. It certainly feels in keeping with the spirit of this evening to be celebrating service and celebrating our communities and the strong uh, fabric that holds us together in that way. If there's anything you'd like to share with us, please do. And this goes to you. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. Barbara Johnson uh, is on our advisory council for Senior Corps, is also a senior companion volunteer. And we thank you on behalf of all our Senior Corps members who serve in the foster grandparent and senior companion programs, as well as all the AmeriCorps programs that uh, serve all our needs here in Oakland County and all of Western North Carolina. Thank you for this recognition, and uh, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a public hearing to consider a rezoning request by Heath White of Zen Tubing. And Nate Pennington will present the rezoning request. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, Board members, and members of the public. My name is Nathan Pennington. I serve as the, as the county's interim planning director. Uh, what you have before you this evening, and I believe you have a presentation to go with this, a few short slides. This is a rezoning request from residential low density to commercial service. The property is located at 1648 Rivard Road, and the applicant is Heath White of Zen Tubing, and the property owner is James Good. Um, the applicant's requesting rezoning of one parcel. It's comprising approximately 4.06 acres. The property was purchased in uh, 2001. It was the former Sandy Bottoms um, uh, Park, uh, and it was purchased from the Dana Boone Council. Here's an aerial map that shows a little more detail. It's a very skinny parcel located right on the French Broad River. Uh, it is located fully in a FEMA designated floodway. The applicant seeking the reason in order to seasonally locate a shipping container on the property to serve as a bar for alcohol sales. It's also the put in for Zen tubing and it's utilized as a temporary use. Staff's main concerns with the rezoning request are that it represents a potential spot zoning and that the alcohol sales would represent an intensification of a commercial use surrounded by a rural, undeveloped area zoned exclusively residentially. As you can see from this map, uh, this represents the residential low density with the green. R1 is down to the in the southeast corner, and the Blue Ridge Parkway is in the northwest corner. 
A portion of the property is also located in the Blue Ridge Parkway overlay. The Planning Board denied the request at their January 22nd public hearing by a vote of 4 to 3, and the Planning Department is recommending a denial of this application request, and I'm here for any additional questions that you may have. Great, great. Nate. Are there any additional questions from commissioners? <clears throat> if not, we can um, open the public hearing. All right, let's go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, I will open the public hearing at 5.39, and I'll invite any members of the public uh, who wish to comment on this rezoning request to uh, have the opportunity to do so now. Hello and thank you for your time. My name is Jim Higgins. I live right across the street from these, uh, from this facility down on 191 Brevard Road. And I can tell you, um, already operating on there as just as in tubing, the traffic there is incredibly, incredibly difficult during the summer. Uh, we already have issues in our traffic issues with 191, 25, 25A being the corridors that take, you know, it, everything that comes off of 26 when it backs up. And so I'm not really sure how they're operating as a uh, Zen tubing currently in a residential space, but the addition of that and the, the uh, other, other facilities in the bar is only going to complicate a really, really bad traffic area. Thank you. Hello, my name is Judith Lyons McCart. I live at 1689 Brevard Road, just a stone's throw from this piece of property in question. Um, like this previous gentleman, I wonder how they've been operating a commercial business right up the road from my house when I was here not maybe a year, maybe two ago, where there was a request for the piece of property directly behind my house that was requesting an open zoning um, that was turned down, so I don't see how um, this gentleman and this property owner is going to um, have their request fulfilled, um, seeing as how the piece of prop, the parcel behind my land was already denied. Um, my hair salon is four miles from where I live, door to door. And on a good day, it takes me 15 minutes to go door to door to my business. When this business is in operation along with the traffic that we've already discussed, this gentleman has discussed, um, it takes me an hour to get home. It takes me an hour to get to my salon. So that poses a very big, significant problem for all of us that live right there along the 91. Also, I can't tell you how many times I've personally been along the hard road, and there have been children and adults in the road. I could not, I could only imagine adding alcohol to that. There's no utilities in that area either. Um, I see there's already been steps that have been cut into the embankment of the French Broad River. I wonder if there was even a permit requested for that to be done. So I have a whole list of things to include that the road has, has flooded through there. The parkway is for the people of our country to drive through here and enjoy the beauty of our, where we live. I can only imagine also driving along there and seeing a great container stay, sitting down there along the river. That would be beautiful. Um, so I respectfully request that this application be denied.
you for the opportunity to speak and thanks for the continuance at your last meeting. My name is Jen Ditzler. I'm married to Heath White and the president of Zen Tudor. Um, the map that I show there has a proposed location of the shipping container and also shows where the river is and where the existing shipping containers are on that property. Um, we already utilize shipping containers on that property and we have agreements in place to move those containers within two hours in case of flooding concerns. Um, we would like to humbly request the rezoning be approved. Um, and to address some of the planning board and um, other concerns that have come up this evening. Um, the land is not paved uh, besides a piece about 15 by 20 foot of concrete. So any rainfall falls into the property, infiltrates into the ground. There's no concern that the water comes off the property and affects the conservation easement that is across Brevard Road. Um, we have employees clean up trash on a daily basis when we are open, so no trash would go out onto Brevard Road. Um, the concerns about the steep slope, moderate slope, high and medium hazard, that is the actual river bank itself. You can see that that is a very small portion of that property, and that is actually the river bank. So the location of the shipping container would not be um, on or near any of those hazard areas. Um, in regards to spot zoning, um, we have had that existing business since 2012 um, with uh, using shipping containers on the FEMA floodway property there to by all the rules and regulations that have been brought up by Buncombe County. We get a, a permit to operate there every year by Buncombe County. Um, there, uh, there's the Blue Ridge Parkway, of course, north, the conservation easement to the east and the river to the west. We have no houses that are on adjacent, exact adjacent properties. Um, we do allow that property to be used by groups such as Riverlink and Greenworks to uh, get in and off the river for river cleanup activities. We take care of uh, trash that's associated with those river cleanup activities. Um, anything that we do there, uh, if any of you know, we have limited um, months that we are on that property and we have limited hours and proposed limited hours for that proposed uh, use of the property. Um, we don't allow parking on the road. That was a concern a couple years ago, and we went ahead and secured additional property, or we secured agreements with the church down the street, so there's no one that parks or is allowed to park on the road. Um, we know that a, a, was a safety concern at one point. The footprint of that building is about 350 square feet, so it's a very small footprint. Um, the parking on, or not the parking, but the um, concerns about traffic on the broad road, those have been there for numerous years. Um, we live in that area as well and deal with that traffic as well. Um, so anytime I-26 backs up like the gentleman discussed, they come to a bar road. That is an existing issue and has been. At some point, uh, DOT is uh, discussing widening Brevard Road, so when that happens, we will probably lose our business there, so this is probably a limited uh, time that we would be able to have this business open, but the, the traffic concerns there that is, are already existing. So thank you very much, and we'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. My name is Heath White. I'm the owner of Zen Tubing, and um, thank you for the continuance last month there. I really appreciate that. I want to make it clear that the, the uh, traffic issues on 191 have nothing to do with Zen Tubing. Um, we, during the summer, we are busy. We took off, and it, it's, a, it's something that people really enjoy to do, to get on the Frenchburg River and enjoy this uh, beautiful natural resource that we do have here in Buckley County. And this is uh, just an extension of what we're going to be doing. The, the, uh, the bar area will be a completely separate business uh, from what we're doing there, but um, but uh, this will be a seasonal type thing. I just want to make that clear. Uh, we will be open from April 1st until the end of October, and then be moving all of that equipment out um, 
during the winter time in case of flood issues and things of that nature. The shipping containers are portable, so that's how we're able to to get around the um, the flood way and floodplain issues that are there. Okay, um, and I think that um, on a lighter side, we're with all the traffic issues on 191, we're going to be helping with the road rage if somebody's able to pull in there and, and relax for a few minutes while they're waiting in line. That, the traffic, with all the factories and whatnot that are up there on 191 right now, the place becoming more and more popular, the state is going to be coming in and widening that road, and I think they've moved it up pretty fast on their agenda to get that done. Whether it comes on our side of the river, or our side of the road, or on the, uh, the easement side, Nobody really knows for sure, but um, but I'm sure they will be coming through there as soon as possible because that is an area that during the five o'clock and during different times like that there is a lot in there. We did address the issues with people parking along the road. The business took off really fast, and um, one day we were working and looked out and there were people parked on the road. And we had children coming back and forth across, and so we're not going to have that. That's not going to happen. There's that road is too dangerous for that. And um, so we did address those issues, and we have uh, we've taken care of that in the last two years. And had any, no one park along the road. People that do park, people can legally park there, and we have asked the state to actually put up no parking signs along the road there because it is a dangerous structure road. So thank you very much for your time. We really do appreciate it. And um, good evening. Chair, Commissioners, I'm David Todd with UNC Asheville. I'm here to uh, represent UNC Asheville. We own the property immediately adjacent to and across 191 from this property. Um, I'm speaking either for or against the zoning, but I want to make the board aware of the significance of our property on the other side of 191. There's a statement I've read a couple of times. I'm not going to read the whole statement again. I'll just give you a, a hopefully quick synopsis. So the university owns the property directly across the road. The property encompasses approximately 35 acres of very rare and sensitive habitat known as the Sandy Bottoms Nature Preserve. We'd like the board to be well informed of the ecological importance of this property. So there are many uh, rare and dangerous species of plants and animals in that particular location that are rare to what is considered an Appalachian mountain bog. The North Carolina Heritage Program lists Sandy Bottoms as a significant natural heritage area with a very high rating in terms of need for protection. We respectfully request that any planning in this area be mindful of the need for protecting the Sandy Bottoms bog. We'd also just like to make the board aware that there are, um, there is parking that occurs in the Nature Conservancy and there is, appears to be where folks are using the bathroom on the property as well. We're also concerned with the widening and possible realignment of 191, that how that might impact either, either side of the property on 191, and concerns that that could, a decision one way or another here could impact how that widening may further impact the property that the university owns on the other side of 191. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Rice. <coughs> About as bad as going to the mall and trying to get through. Uh, I don't have a problem with property rights of that nature, but in this area and being around as long as I have, there ain't no commissioner up there that knows the problems that they've had in Sandy Bottom with crime. And adding a drink to the problem is not going to create nothing but more crime. And uh, I think it'd be worthwhile asking the sheriff's department just how many things that they, and I say things, there's a lot of crimes that were committed there years ago, and, and it's well documented. It's in the newspaper, and I think when you have a place like that that's got a history of crime uh, against its citizens, 
I think you need to investigate that. The best thing to do is just vote it down tonight and forget it. And then do the investigation later because I know what that means. Thank you. <coughs> All right, anyone else? All right, seeing no others, I will close the public hearing at 5.52, and I'll bring it back to the board for further discussions, questions, or motion. I'd like to make a motion to um, deny based on review of the planning board and their recommendations. All right, there's a motion to deny the request for rezoning based on the recommendations of staff, the planning board, and inconsistency with county land use policy. Further discussion? Further discussion. Uh, yes, I will. Uh, okay. After listening to uh, neighbors in that uh, area there, and I am a neighbor, I live with them miles of where it is. It is a very bad highway and with the zone and everything, I think uh, with the road coming through, spot zoning, something like that, in a short time it could be open. And the danger, I think I will have to vote against this also. And check on that. Mr. Rice had a good point of what's went on there. Yes, what Zen Cuban's done is a great business model he has of letting people enjoy the river. But I have never seen where alcohol and water mix real good together. So, so I'd also like to comment on the, uh, I think the, the, the tubing business there is, is uh, it's great. People, uh, people enjoy it. Um, you know, I have the uh, concern about the, this is about the alcohol and the News Observer recently did an article that Buncombe County was uh, number one in the state for intoxications in 552. Wake was second. And uh, I know it's not the intent of these, this business to add to that, but uh, I, I, I can't support adding alcohol to the, uh, to the business, even for a short, even for a short period of time. Um, the tubing part, it's a lot of fun. I hope to come over there and utilize it, utilize it myself. But I'll be voting against it. Okay, all in favor of the motion to deny, please say aye. 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 Any opposed to the motion? Thank you. Okay. The next up is the update on the Isaac Coleman project. And um, Commissioners Whitesides and Frost are going to, uh, I think, help tee this off. And then Lisa Eby and community engagement staff will also be participating. did something. 
last year we did something that people were amazed at. We voted 7-0 for the Isaac Coleman initiative to begin, and then the same night we voted 7-0 for the, just, for the inception of the Justice Resource Center. And we celebrated that. Because even to the blight of those horrible numbers, we chose as a community to do something. So when I knew the anniversary was coming up, I thought about Isaac. And I thought, you know what he would say? And I look forward to this evening with great enthusiasm. And then, last week, we all witnessed that horrible video. <coughs> Dr. King said, we all die a little bit when we become silent about things that matter. And we can't be silent. We have to go forward with hope and drive and push. You all are going to hear amazing stories of resilience and the work the community has done to change things. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention Mr. Johnny Germain Rush, because he was doing everything we want everybody to do. He just finished working 13 hours. He was carrying his food home from his, the restaurant he worked in, and he was walking. Now, Lisa's going to go over some of the statistics, but one of the things that sticks out in my mind is the income. A white person and a black person in Buncombe County can have the same job, and they'll be paid $1,000 less per month. The same job. But this board was moved to make a difference. We did that collectively. And I look at who's here tonight, and I know we're going to continue to go forward because you all inspire me and you've moved this board. So, on that note, um, I want to thank Lisa Eby. We um, Mandy Stone, Health and Human Services, led by Lisa Eby. We spoke to community leaders. We researched collaboratively across the country. We went to Washington, D.C., spoke with educators, spoke with the Department of Justice. Um, a tremendous amount of research from her team went into this, and um, I'm grateful for her service. But most of all, I'm grateful for all of you, because the <coughs> vote on this 7-0 means a tremendous amount to the community. And now we can hear from Lisa. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I want to start out by talking about a recent strip trip I took that I was invited to go out to Omaha, Nebraska in the middle of the winter. <laughs> and the reason why I was invited is that the Warren Buffett Foundation has done a lot of work in communities. And they were interested in what we're doing in Buncombe County. And uh, one of the things I took away from that trip was that the Buffett Foundation spends tremendous amount of dollars and resources in looking at communities in the same way that they look at businesses. And what they do is they build capacity in the leaders in their community. They take the time to uh, give them the opportunities to build fil uh, facilitation skills, to build the kind of um, necessary uh, competencies that allow them to be tremendous leaders just like you would want to do in any business. And so tonight you're going to hear the thanks goes to the, the people in this community every day, the leaders in our community who have taken the time to say I can make a difference and to, and to invest their time, energy, and talent in our community. Um, it was about a year ago on February 21st that you all voted um, and, and heard from Dr. Dwight Mullen. And I just want to remind you again of what was at stake. Uh, Dr. Mullen detailed pervasive trends and disparities in Buncombe um, County across multiple sectors. In health in Buncombe County, black babies are two times more likely to be born prematurely, 
four times more likely to be born with a very low birth weight, which is one of the single most important predictors for health and life. Black babies are three times more likely to die in our community before their first birthday. And black people, on average, die six years earlier than white people in Northern County. In education, black children lag significantly behind in our schools. 35% of black children read at grade level versus 71% of white children. 32% of black children are at grade level in mathematics versus 68% of white children. Those numbers are staggering. And they translate into lower educational achievement and a lifetime of lower earnings. Uh, in wages in Buncombe County in 2015, black adults earned $1,135 less a month compared to whites in our community. And the median household income for blacks in the community was $26,000 versus $46,000 for whites. Again, huge disparities, things that we can't turn our back on. In addition, Dr. Mullen detailed differences in small business ownership, small business earnings, home ownership, and crime data such as black males who only represent 5.6% of our population, and yet on any given day, 28% of the average is uh, of, uh, in the Buncombe County Detention Center. In each of this, in these sectors, there's a long documented history of racial disparities, and we know these numbers follow similar trends for others, such as our Latino neighbors. And what this historical data also enforces for us is it demonstrates clearly that previous attempts to close these gaps have not worked. We can't keep continuing to do the same things we've done in the past because we have a long uh, historical data that says it's not working. We must be, do something different. We must, like the Warren Buffett Foundation, invest in the leadership that exists in our community already. Because when we fail to address these disparities, we live with lower educational and job readiness, lower wages in every employment sector, greater health disparities, housing problems, and the very real loss of human potential. Untapped, unused, unfulfilled. And in some cases, we lose talent leading our community. That is why efforts such as the Justice Resource Center, which was also funded last February, and the Isaac Coleman Investment <coughs> Grants matter. In addition to these innovative grants, we've heard clearly from the community, <coughs> and in large part from the work that Dwayne Barton did with the Historically Black Neighborhood Councils, that change must take root and spring forth from our neighborhoods and communities. This was further re reinforced for us through the mobilizing through mobilizing action for resilient communities grant that we uh, received when we were able to use those dollars to provide those small tipping grants and we got a window into what was happening into our community and saw the scores of people that were already doing work to make a difference in their neighborhoods. They're building, their parents that are taking the time to uh, buy uniforms for kids, cheerleading outfits, taking them on school trips, their parents that have developed on their own job readiness programs for youth, and they are neighbors who come together to build community gardens and share those fresh vegetables with others. Ordinary people making a difference each day with a force of vision and very few resources. And so what we found is that we can harness that potential in our community, and thanks to the bold action of you all, you said we can, we can do something different, and so you decided to fund the seven investment grants through Isaac Coleman. We are learning a lot about what those grants are, are returning on our investment, and we're learning that they're building strong, trusting relationships that allow people to have the infrastructure within their neighborhoods that they can use to collectively make a difference. We're building on the existing capacity of community leaders and just helping to enhance that and make it stronger. And we're creating the space and opportunity to evaluate what's working and what's not working and adjust strategy in real time. And that's moving us toward greater pipelines of opportunity. Essential to this process is our need to innovate and to try new things and see if they work. And if they don't, use that as a learning opportunity and figure out why they're not working. And again, continually adjust and adapt. When we um, asked for these grants to be funded, we knew that we could not close the gap on those staggering numbers in a year's time or two years' time. But 
What we did know is that we could learn a lot from the community about how to make this work sustainable and make it meaningful. And tonight you're going to hear from the members of our community on their progress. And um, I've also learned a lot um, as a government employee about ways that we can better partner with people. So I'm going to let Commissioner Whiteside say a few words and then Kim is going to first introduce the Thank you. I'd like to say that I'm fortunate <clears throat> in being the newest member on the commission uh, working with the group up there. We were able, <clears throat> or they were, to pull it off. And one thing i fought for all my life is to make sure uh, that everybody is playing on the same playing field. And this is what we're trying to do here. We all have heard the numbers. We know how bad they are. But if we don't start doing something about it, we'll never get there. And let's face it, if we can move the open cut here through all that granite, we can turn this around too. But it will take time to do it. Uh, and that's what I just would, I'm sorry that my friend Isaac is not here to see this because he fought for this, what we're doing a lot longer than I did, uh, than I have. But, We've got to get there, and I think you are what you'll hear uh, moments from now from the group is they have made headway. It's a start, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, and the only thing, too, I would like to add before you all come on, that it's appalling to me when I heard what happened to the gentleman in August. Folks, 20 years ago, in November of 1988, I was driving south with my family, my younger daughter, my older daughter was in Carolina already, and the policeman pulled us over. And that's when I was reminded from what I went through in the 60s, how it is when you're driving, being a black man. But what's unfortunate, here we are almost 20 years later, and the same thing is going on. And we've got to stop it. We cannot afford to have this to go on. You know, I worry about my grandkids, my grandsons, and others. But it's something, and it's not, I'll say it's not all law enforcement officers, no. But it's like cancer. If you don't take it out, it'll just get worse. But what I want to do, though, I didn't come here for that, but I wanted to brag sort of about the Isaac Coleman and what we've done so far. And Keelan Lake is going to come forward now and introduce uh, the different groups who are working on Isaac Coleman, and I'm sure you'll be as happy as I've been. I've been following it, close working with them, but they are doing great work. But as I said, it's only a start. we still got a ways to go. Good afternoon. First of all, again, my name is Keenan Lake. I'm a part of the community engagement team. Um, like it was so eloquently put before the people before me, you know, we're here to talk about the Isaac Coleman uh, grant and the initiative and the recipients who have received these grants. You're going to hear from seven people. They're going to all have a minute and a half to talk. And what you're going to hear is just a snapshot of the great work that they're doing in the community and what's happening, not only galvanizing our community, not only forming, building relationships and forming, forming partnerships, but being able to give back and uplift the communities that we're talking about. Commissioner Newman, you spoke in your opening remarks about division and the way we heal from that, and you talked about prayer. Well, I agree. Prayer is the, the number one thing in my opinion. However, I feel that this board, I think that you guys opened up a, a great box last year when you opened up and nominated the, the Isaac Coleman grant and allowed that to take place, shaping our community for years to come. So with that, no further ado, I would like to introduce from D Review, Ms. Lucia Darty. I'm going to have Shonda Jackson just join me here at the podium as our uh, parent community liaison in this venture, based out of Deaver. Thank you for your time and for your leadership. With the volunteer stipend program in Deaver View, we chose a multi-tiered approach to volunteerism in our stipend program, which better allows residents to choose their level of involvement while receiving a stipend for the contribution of their time, energy and expertise. 
The first level of involvement is through participation in individual community meetings or events as they arise. The second level of participation involves volunteering weekly at the nearby Johnston Elementary School. We are currently working to establish and strengthen the relationship between Johnston and the Deaverview community as there are 60 Johnston students who are also Deaverview residents. We firmly believe that the school could serve as a hub for youth enrichment activities and parent leadership opportunities, which could directly benefit, benefit both the community and the school. We have resident volunteers and proudly the proud to say we have resident volunteers who are currently active in the school's cafeteria work, its resource center, its classrooms, as new members of the PTO, and working on site with both the student support specialist and the stipend program outreach coordinator to uh, launch a youth poetry club and mentorship program for Deaverview Johnston youth. The highest level of participation is weekly vol volunteerism on site in Deaverview. We currently have resident volunteers who are actively involved in the formation of a Deaverview Leadership Council um, and assisting with flyer and sur survey distribution, helping students safely board and exit school buses, and participation in a community resiliency focus group. Lastly, I will say that what we've learned in this venture is that uh, establishing and rebuilding a trust takes time. And while working with a community that has been through so much as Deaverview has, um, establishing solid relationships with residents is paramount. And we've been working to build those relationships and hope to continue building upon this program. Thank you for your time. And we are happy moving forward to collaborate with great uh, leader organizations like the YTL training program, Libby Cox. We have been doing this work two years prior, three years prior, and with the Isaac Coleman grant, we've been able to do several things. First, we've been able to research and start an advocacy program. We have two advocates that work within Asheville City School System and in Bowdoin County to assist students who are struggling academically. Um, we also have established or are in our second year of our after school program and our fifth year of our summer camp program. And what the Isaac Coleman grant allowed us to do was train our staff in mindfulness. Um, one of the things that we recognize is that the students that we work with live in trauma um, on a daily basis. And not just the students, but also the parents. So what we try to do is create an environment where we are supporting the family, not just the student, but the family. And we give parents opportunities to um, say what they need for their students and we make sure that we try to connect them with the resources that they need and also we make sure that we try to um, give them that space for mindfulness as well making sure that they are able to care for themselves as, while we're caring for their children. In addition to that this year we are starting what's called Parent Rise at Ashland Middle School which is rewriting the narrative with innovative support and educational opportunities which we are leaning heavily on Lucia and the DVV community looking at their stipend program. Um, and the hope is that by bringing parents into the school community, they will have an opportunity to rewrite the narrative of trauma that they have already experienced in the school system and so that they can better support their students. And so another amazing thing about this being a grant recipient is the opportunity to collaborate with other organizations that are as passionate about the youth as YTL is. Um, My Community Matters collaboration is such an organization, and so Shavonda Harper will come up and tell you more about that collaboration. Good evening, members of the board. I'm Shavonda Harper, um, representing the My Community Matters collaborative. And that's made up of the My Community Matters of the um, Residence Council of the Asheville Housing Authority, um, Word on the Street with uh, Asheville Writers in the Schools, and Positive Changes Youth Ministry, which is a college readiness program. And we all work together out of the Eddington Center where our three groups uh, kind of work together and our youth are um, working between the three groups. 
Um, the, uh, the youth have been working on documentaries, um, doing interviews at different uh, public events, and um, working to build up our young leadership so that they can be the ones to tell the story in the future. Uh, to help document what we're doing, the works that we're doing collaboratively in other groups, such as the Emma community. Um, uh, they, they've just started with the documentary that they're doing to tell the story of their community. And so um, with that, I'd like to um, introduce Patty, where we um, worked and um, hosted them at the Eddington Center last summer for their two-week summer program and uh, welcome them into our community uh, because they are a part of our community. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Patty. Good evening. Uh, my name is Patti Guerra. I come from the Emma community. El haber recibido la beca nos ayudó a poder organizar el campamento de verano. Receiving the, uh, the Isaac Coleman grant has helped us organize the summer camp. El cual también nos ayudó a traer a los padres a participar, a participar para que tomaran el liderazgo para ayudar a, a llevar a cabo el campamento. This has also helped us bring in parents to participate and help them develop leadership, a leadership role, uh, in order to create this camp for their children. Al finalizar el campamento, los niños se pusieron muy tristes. After the camp was over, the children got really sad. Pero también se pusieron contentos al ver a sus padres que estuvieron participando en ello. But they were really happy to see that their parents were involved in the camp. Pudimos ver la gran diferencia entre re recibir un servicio que viene de afuera. We were able to see the huge difference it, um, it makes when um, between receiving help from outside. Como muchos programas que sirven a la comunidad. Because there are a lot of service-based organizations that serve our community. Y crear un recurso que es para tu propia comunidad. But this resource was created by our community. Y creado por la misma comunidad. And was created by the same community, for our community. Tuvimos la oportunidad de trabajar a profundidad con el condado. We had the opportunity to work on a deeper level with the county. Que en mi persona pensé que nunca nos iban a dar esos fondos. That I personally never thought we would get those funds for. Porque trabajamos principalmente con la, con la comunidad indocumentada because we work primarily with the undocumented community. I also want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to work with African American people. Que ellos también están sufriendo uh, con, por el mismo sistema que sufrimos nosotros. Because that community is suffering under the same system that we're suffering under. Y que ahora sabemos que no estamos solos como lo pensábamos. And now we know that we're not alone like we thought previously. También estamos trabajando en un plan que nos permita preservar los parqueaderos de trailers. We're also working on a plan that will allow us to preserve mobile home parks. Porque hemos visto la venta y pérdida de varios parqueaderos a través del condado. Because we've seen the sale and loss of several mobile home parks around the county. En los últimos años in the last few years. También estamos creando modelos y recursos para crear cooperativas de vivienda. We're also creating models and resources to create housing cooperatives. Para que nuestra comunidad pueda tener estabilidad y echar raíces donde vivimos. So that our community can have stability and put down roots where we live. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Y muchas gracias a, a Eddington Center que nos ha abierto las puertas para nuestra comunidad. And thank you so much to the Eddington Center for opening up their doors to our community. Next up, we'll have Mrs. Dixon coming to talk about the Shallow Community.
members. Thank you so much for having us. And I'm going to show you something right now. With the members of the E.W. Pearson uh, Project Collaborative, please stand and stand with me. We want to thank you, commissioners, for the support that we received through the Isaac Coleman grant. This has been a wonderful experience for all of us. This initiative has rekindled a strong network that historically our neighborhoods have always had. The collaborative has not only rekindled a stronger network, but work is being done collectively. Our youth are learning strong ties to their communities and financial literacy in all communities. The families of all of our neighborhoods are coming out more to foster a sense of we and us, showing that neighbors can work together to get things done. This initiative is supporting emerging leaders, and this is some of them, <laughs> from all three communities. This, collaborative, this collective group provides cultural identity that brings people together. And so I just wanted you to see that we do stand together. Thank you, and now I would like to introduce, uh, I believe I'm introducing Ray Mapp, and I want to thank him for his work with, with and folks who reside in the historical Southside community. Ray Mapp. Good afternoon, members of the chamber, chairman, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, United Community Development is a North Carolina nonprofit, and we currently uh, have a reapproval re of our 501c3 pending. Um, our mission is to end poverty uh, in the South Side, Oregon, uh, South Side area of uh, the community by establishing social enterprises, uh, which include um, cooperatively owned businesses and small businesses that will uh, provide job training in high growth industries like green infrastructure um, and um, weatherization. Um, we also want to create um, supply chains where People can make living wages and have uh, jobs and operations that will be sustainable for years to come. Um, we began um, our program by training low-income people to do uh, weatherization. And um, to, to this date, we have weatherized uh, approximately six homes in two months. That's how long we've been doing this program. And we've, we're paying stipends uh, that are living wage, at least $13 an hour. Um, we um, also are ready with the professionals that we have on staff to uh, do what is called, um, what is called life and health uh, improvements in homes as far as improving floors and doorways and things like that, or real stairs, things that, that will make it set, make how homes safer for people who are in poverty, because they have some conditions that are pretty bad. At first, our board uh, proposed to um, teach um, concrete and masonry, um, and even when we were proposing and, and thinking about proposing this uh, program, we were also considering some other options because we knew that um, masonry programs require uh, years of apprenticeships and training and, and jobs may not come right away. And uh, one of the challenges that we have in our community is our people need to work as soon as possible. We need to get income. So um, we were happy to get suggestions from members of the um, County Commission to actually go into weatherization, which we were able to do. And um, fortunately, on our staff, we have professionals who are LEED certified, and we have 
uh, a, a very talented professional who is um, uh, great at doing residential remodeling and and and, and brick and cement uh, work. And together, these two professionals, uh, one of them is Dee Williams, and the other one is uh, Mr. Robert Edgerton, they have over 62 years of combined experience. So we have the leadership we need to do these types of uh, trainings and jobs. And we, we're making tremendous success. Um, one of our trainees that we're working with now happened to be certified in weatherization by Ashwell Grove. But because he was not able to get work for three years, he has to be recertified. So we're working to be able to recertify people so they can do jobs beyond what we're, what we're training them to do. Uh, we have several allies who have been awesome in making a, and help make sure we make progress. And uh, as I mentioned to you, if you're here, would you please stand? Uh, we have um, the Astro chapter. Uh, for showing up for racial justice surge. If any members are here, please stand. All right. And um, we also have the Quakers who have been very great in providing funds to help us make progress. Thanks, we are. And um, Black Lives Matter, actual Black Lives Matter, any members from there, please? Okay. Um, Code for Asheville. Anybody for Code for Asheville? Cope Asheville has uh, been very instrumental in helping us gather data because uh, one thing that's unique about United Community Development <coughs> is um, we want to do data collection so we know if we're getting results and we, we can find out ourselves where results need to be improved. Okay, and um, with all that being said, uh, we'd like to brag about the fact that we have a social enterprise learning center pretty much completed now, so we can actually do manufacturing of window inserts, and we have the patent pending. So anyway, uh, I'm being rushed down, uh, rushed away from the podium. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, Kathy Avery from Epiphel, who's doing great work in the South Side. Good evening, commissioners. Um, my name is Kathy Avery. I'm the nurse with an organization called Avila, and um, what we have done is formed a co-op. And we started out, it's a worker-owned co-op, and the people that are with us are, came from Jane Hatley's idea with Self-Help Credit Union. She came up, she went to a conference that showed the co-op model, and she came back and talked to Kimberly Hunter at Mountain Bizworks, so they're our partners now. And she said, well, she knows about a bit, but go to them, because they'll be able to help this. And so where I'm working out in the field as a nurse, and we do door-to-door -door method, which is a new idea, um, we found that people sometimes need cleaning before they can get their health taken care of. I mean, I may be going out to talk about diabetes and other things, but if you get ready to get evicted because your, your housekeeping skills are not up to par. So what we ended up doing was intervening and cleaning people's homes and doing what was needed there so I could get to the health issues. So when she came to us with this great idea, I thought, oh, this would be a great co-op because we want people to have a living wage. And so we started out talking about it. We said $12, and we went up to $15 because, of course, you got to pay your taxes. So, and then our co-op members got together, and we've been working on governance, and we've been working on legalities and, and the structure for a co-op. And then we decided that we needed to a membership, and okay, what would that membership look like? And so our people um, started out with, they took, paid $200 a year for the membership. And our co-op people decided that it would make it more significant for them if they paid $600 a year. Well, I'm not gonna argue with that. So that's what we decided to do. So one of the things that we've done is clean people's homes and help them not be evicted the managers of some of these apartments complexes, they love us. And so we've been able to do that. And another thing is for people to age in place. So we have a new co-op member that was able to have a living wage and go out and help one of, our, one of our clients be able to stay in her home. And that's been a wonderful experience for us to be able to do that. And that's one of the things we're gonna start doing more of is helping people age in place. 
And so those kind of things is what our co-op wants to do, and we want to be able to give a living wage and also address those things that we're finding in the underserved populations. But we also need to pull in people who have money who needs um, things done in their home, too, and they just don't have the time and the energy to do it. That way we have a, a paying part that also helps us take care of those people that can't pay that needs a lot of services. So that's the idea, and it's working, and we're just so proud of what we've done so far. And I would like to introduce Rashida McDaniels, one of our engagement members. Thank you very much, and I'm just so proud of everyone here, and especially the Isaac Coleman grantees. So the funding has been successfully deployed to continue the great work in creating pipelines to jobs and education. But we have only scratched the surface. Commissioners, we need your continued support and investment. We have built trust. We have stronger relationships and opportunity to help these programs build their foundations. So when I'm thinking about foundations, I'm thinking about the castle on the hill. And what I make reference to that, I'm talking about Stevens Lee High School. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have so many leaders that have come out of the high school to build a foundation in this community. And I want to focus on four people that was important to this community and my family. We have Marcel Proctor, who's in this community and developed his own trucking and restaurant business. And he was the same guy that was a part of the Lunch and Learn to talk about redlining in this community. We have Henry Logan and the late Benny Lake, who soared in sports in our community and participated in local basketball camps that my father was even a part of. They encouraged the importance of education in this community and developing a trade to give back to your community. We have Herbert Watts, White Daddy that was an Asheville police officer in this community for years that participated in summer camp, would stop at the Eddington Center and give out the badges and say be proud of who you are in these communities. They named a park after him in, in, in Erskine. And then we finally have C.L. Moore. My father used to talk about him, and they call him Professor. He was a professor or coach in his community at Stevens Lee. And he was a new face on the recreation commission that the Buncombe County commissioners developed during that time. So these are the leaders and foundation that we come from and that we should be proud of. So today, I want the Isaac Coleman folks to stand because you will see the new faces, the new leaders in this room and I am proud of the people we serve and the people who we support, who support this work. And I'm so thankful for you guys, the commissioners. You have no idea. I'm so thankful. And I'm thankful for the people we serve today. you who are here tonight and um, thanks for this great update. Uh, it's very inspiring and uh, a lot of great things are happening. So um, we're not taking any votes tonight, but it's uh, great to see the progress that's been made since we last talked about this as a, as a commission. Okay, all right. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Next up is our board appointments. So we have um, taken action earlier in this meeting to expand the number of applicants who will be appointed to the library board to nine. And we uh, interviewed nine great people now. So is there a motion for the board to appoint them all? Yes, Please, please do. Uh, please uh, list the nine uh, nominees. I'll second the motion. The nine nominees and library board members Pending a vote were Barbara Weatherall, Linda Wilkerson, Ray Watson Griffin, Ruth O'Donnell, Amanda Marriage, Stephen Stackhouse, Karen Griggis, Lindley Barger, and Michael McHugh. All in favor, please say aye. 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 
Any interest? All right, thank you to all the new members of the new and reconstituted Duncan County Library Board. If you are interested in county library concerns, uh, please plan on coming to one of the upcoming library board meetings and uh, feel free to participate with our, with our newly reconstituted board. All right, next, um, <clears throat> we've got the Asheville Board of Adjustment spot. We did interviews two weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> And um, we have not heard any updates from the applicant who did not um, come to the last meeting. And uh, Kathy, you reached out to her and she was, uh, what was the response or what was the non-response? Uh, time expires you can leave any questions along with your name address and phone number with our county manager Andy Stone. board members are not expected to comment on any matters during public comment this is the public's chance to speak to us and uh, the board reserves the right to deny public address on subjects that we've already previously uh, had public comment on earlier in the meeting this evening are there any members of the public who would like to speak this time Mr. Rice? And uh, please tell us your name and where you live. <laughs> For any other folks who aren't aware of the policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here we go. I live in Cameron. Thank you. you know where that is, Joe? Oh, absolutely. All right. Yes, sir. I'm going to hit you up that you're going to be looking at in the future here. And when it comes to the county school system in the city, we talked about the $20.9 million that they're holding. Number one, I'd like publicly, I'm asking that you provide me, your county manager, whoever you can get to, the clerk. I'd like to have the policy or the ordinance, anyone, that is given to Buncombe County and the city of Asheville to hold uh, this money that they've got there that the uh, supplemental tax back in 92, the board adopted a policy, school board, and uh, they since revised it even as March 1st. Number one, they do not have tax authority. And the next problem, I would say, is this county, unless you've got a policy or a law that's saying that they can hold that money. They should not be holding it and spending it at their leisure. Because that is taxpayers' money and it's raised by this board here and given to them from this board. And I have yet to see a policy or ordinance and I brought this up even back in the 90s. This originally started with Patrick Keever did something like two hundred and fifty some thousand dollars I think at that point. And it started from there, and she was a teacher organization uh, president. So it started from there. I haven't seen anything, and I would sure like to get my hands on it. Because if I've been here that long and haven't found it, and this has been an issue I've brought up many times, I have no problem against tax money going for supplement. But when it gets being six million dollars over 15 years sitting over there in their money bank and the taxpayers are suffering, even through the hard times, they've got a bankroll over there in the county and the city likewise. 
$20.9 million in their pocket. I am concerned that this board ain't doing their fiduciary duty if that is the case. So I'm going to leave it as a question at this point because I haven't seen it and I've asked for it years and years ago and even recently. So uh, I think you do your due diligence and I've done mine by telling you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi. Um, uh, my name is Ken Higgins. I'm here in support of the um, fox trapping regulation. The uh, Buncombe County doesn't have a fox trapping law. It was done away with um, 30 or 40 years ago for people that fox hunted with dogs, and uh, nobody does it anymore. Now we have an exploding fox population, and support from this uh, would help the state establish a fox trapping regulation. I think about 70 or 80 uh, counties have a fox trapping regulation. Buncombe County doesn't. Um, I have a farm with free range chickens. I've lost 40% of them to foxes. And um, there was a 2012 study done by the state wildlife agent uh, supporting and recommending a change in state laws to allow fox trapping. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to address the board at this time? Yes, ma'am. So I know I've spoken to you once tonight. My name is Libby Kyles. In addition to um, being the executive director of YTL training programs, I'm also on the Buncombe County Women's Commission, and I am a public school teacher at Isaac Dixon Elementary School. And I just want to say thank you for several things, but most importantly for being open and creating an opportunity for us to have a new building as a school. I don't know how many times you've heard it. and uh, You weren't all on the commission when you all voted to fund Isaac Dixon Elementary School, but I just think that every now and then you need to be reminded of the awesome things that you've done in our community. Thank you very much. It's a great school. With great teachers. That's pretty cool. <laughs> all right. Anyone? <laughs> um, anyone else? All right. Um, got a couple of announcements. On March 13th at 3 p.m., the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners and the, Ash and the Asheville City Council will hold a joint meeting on the first floor conference room at 200 College Street. On March 13th at 5.30 p.m., the Board of Commissioners will participate in the ribbon cutting on the new renovated Health and Human Services building at 40 Cox Avenue in Asheville. On March 20th at 12.30 p.m., the Commissioners will hold a workshop to discuss budget and affordable housing issues. There will be no regular meeting at 5 p.m. on uh, March 20th. Okay. Those are all of our announcements. We do have a closed session to address two matters. Mr. Frew. Yeah, yes, sir. Pursuant to General Statute 143-318-11A3, we have two uh, attorney matters to preserve the attorney-client privilege. Expect just simply direction from the board matters. All right. So we're going to do that to hear from our attorney. And uh, when we uh, Come back in closed session. We will go back into open session, but no actions will be taken by the board when we come back out of closed session. Is there a motion to go into closed session? Okay. All right. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. We're in closed session. We're in closed session.
Yeah. Uh -huh.